Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Eric Plaken, and I am the medical director and CEO of the Austin Riggs Center. We're delighted to begin the events in this year's collaboration between the Erickson Institute of the Austin Riggs Center and the Sigmund Freud Museum in Vienna. The project we're embarking on together is From Despair to Hope, the Holocaust, Immigration, and Psychoanalysis in North America. This topic is especially important given the rise of anti-Semitism in this country and around the world. The causes and effects of the Holocaust remain with us today. As psychoanalysts, we know something about the effects of trauma and the risks of its intergenerational transmission. Nevertheless, we have more to learn about these important contributors to human suffering. I'm so pleased that we can continue our learning in this conversation among three frankly beloved colleagues, Otto Kernberg, Tom Kohut, and Nancy McWilliams. As we begin, let me note that the Austin Riggs Center is in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, a town started as a mission to the Mahikanyak or Mohicans, who are the indigenous peoples of this land. With sometimes painful self-reflection and with humility, we acknowledge that we are learning, speaking, and gathering on their ancestral homelands. After enduring tremendous hardship and being forced from here, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We honor and pay respect to their ancestors past and present as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. Thank you for joining us today and would like to extend a very warm welcome to all panelists uh, and all participants. And I would also like to take the opportunity, first of all, to thank Eric Blankun, um, Jane Tillman, and Alison Lott for this wonderful collaboration. As you may know, today's event is in some way the prelude of an extensive collaboration that will include four Zoom roundtable discussions on the, one, on the one hand, and the exhibition Organized Escape Psychoanalysts in Exile on the other hand, an exhibition which will be on display at the Ericsson Institute and at Austin Ricks in June 2023, and which stems from an exhibition that was developed here in Vienna in 2021 in collaboration with the members of the Arbeitsgruppe für die Geschichte der Psychoanalyse, the Working Group on History of Psychoanalysis. Um, yes, and in this exhibition, we showed and we honored the engagement and the commitment of the international psychoanalytic community to save the threatened Jewish members of the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society after the Anschluss of Austria to Hitler Germany in 1938. Also, we were interested in the development and in the advancement of psychoanalysis in exile, especially in the United States. As scientific and clinical practice never take place in a vacuum, but always in a specific sociocultural context with the arrival of the Viennese analysts in the States, also shifts in the psychoanalytic theory building went hand in hand. Well, these developments, but also the personal fates and careers of emigres, the experiences of loss and adaptation um, are also the focus on our, of our series. And I am particularly pleased that today Otto Kernberg will disco discuss his own experiences of emigration together with Thomas Kohut, who will discuss the experiences of his father, Heinz, together with Nancy McWilliam. After all, Tom Kohut is also the person to whom we owe this collaboration. Tom, in these last years, you have repeatedly pointed out how appropriate it would be to work together, given the interdisciplinary orientation of both the Sigmund Freud Museum and the Ericsson Institute at Austin Riggs. Thank you so much for bringing us together for this exciting teamwork. And now I would like to turn the floor to Jane Tillman. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome to the first of four roundtables examining the experience of immigrants and refugees and how North American psychoanalysis has been shaped by this diverse group. My name is Jane Tillman. I'm the Evelyn Stephenson Neff Director of the Erickson Institute here at the Austin Riggs Center. 
The roundtables are part of a larger project that the Erickson Institute is embarking on in collaboration with the Freud Museum Vienna, entitled From Despair to Hope, The Holocaust, Immigration, and Psychoanalysis in North America. As you've heard this summer here in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, we will open an exhibition that has already been at the Freud Museum Vienna that tells the story of the organized escape of psychoanalysts from Vienna in the 1930s. I hope you will attend the remaining three roundtables. And if you're in Stockbridge this summer, we'd love to have you come and visit the exhibition. I also want to extend my thanks to Dr. Tom Kohut for arranging this collaboration, to the Freud Museum Vienna and Daniela Fenzi, and of course to Drs. Kernberg and Mick Williams for their participation in this roundtable. Tom is a longtime member of the Council of Scholars of the Erickson Institute and the president of the Freud Foundation. And he brought our two institutions together to create this series for 2023. And I also thank our generous underwriters for this project, particularly Stephen Ackerman. Now some housekeeping. You'll find information in the chat function of Zoom about how to obtain continuing education credits for this program. Later in the program, we will take questions for Drs. Kernberg and Kohut through the question and answer function, not chat, through the Q&A function in Zoom. Please, as you're doing, continue using the chat to introduce yourself and tell us where you're joining from. We have a worldwide audience today. This webinar is being recorded. It will be available online free of charge in approximately four weeks. We're doing something interesting to augment this project. As part of our collaboration, we will be collecting stories about immigrant and refugee experiences. And we invite you to participate by contributing a written story, a short video or audio of your family or personal experience of immigration. And if you're a psychoanalyst, how this might inform your choice of profession. Instructions for how to participate in this oral history project are also in the chat. And now I'm delighted to introduce our moderator for today, uh, Dr. Nancy McWilliams. Nancy McWilliams is visiting professor emerita at Rutgers Graduate School of Applied and Professional Psychology. And she has a private practice in Lambertville, New Jersey. She is the author of four textbooks on psychoanalytic diagnosis, case formulation, psychotherapy, and supervision, available in 20 languages, and, co and she co-edited both editions of the Psychodynamic Diagnostic Manual, or the PDM. A former president of Division 39 of the American Psychological Association, Dr. McWilliams is also a member of the Austin Rigg Center Board of Trustees. And so, Nancy, I will turn this over to you, and we look forward to an exciting discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. It is my honor to moderate this roundtable discussion. Uh, Drs. Kernberg and Kohut are extraordinarily accomplished people, but rather than squandering much of our short time on introductions and awards, we all agreed to keep introductions to a, a bare minimum. So let me first introduce them, starting with Dr. Kernberg. Born in Vienna, Dr. Otto Kernberg and his family fled Nazi Germany in 1939, eventually emigrating to Chile. In 1961, he emigrated to the United States, joining the Menninger Hospital and Institute. Among other significant professional roles, he was most recently professor of clinical psychiatry at the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Columbia University. He's past president of the International Psychoanalytical Association, and he's the author or co-author of many books, most recently one very pertinent to our discussion, titled Hatred, Emptiness, and Hope. Now let me introduce Dr. Kohut. Dr. Thomas Kohut is currently Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III Professor of History at Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts. He's also a graduate of the Cincinnati Psychoanalytic Institute. Professor Kohut is president of the Freud Foundation of the United States. He has written several books. Most notably, his recent one is also relevant to our talk today, Empathy and the Historical Understanding of the Human Past. 
with those very scaled down introductions, uh, we all had decided that we would start with Professor Kohut. And I, I'm going to encourage both panelists to talk both personally and more intellectually and theoretically and professionally about the impact of the refugee experience during and after the Holocaust. So, Professor Kohut, you are on. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, so there, there are a whole lot of people I see who have registered for this, and it's clear I know almost none of you, but I thought I'd actually begin by saying something personal or making a personal ad acknowledgement that it's a bit difficult for me to be here to talk about um, this subject, uh, in part because I feel uncomfortable trying to quote unquote represent my father here. Uh, so I'm not going to try to represent my father. Uh, I'm going to represent me. Uh, and uh, what I am, as uh, Nancy just mentioned, is although I've had, had psych a psychoanalytic education, uh, I am a historian and I'm an academic. And what I'm going to say today is going to reflect that identity probably more than the fact that I'm the son of Heinz Code. Um, and I actually, as a historian and academic, have a kind of academic agenda here. I want to convince you, although maybe this group doesn't need convincing, but I want to convince clinicians and non-clinicians alike about the powerful psychological impact that history has on human beings, that historical events like the Holocaust have on human beings. And I'm gonna use the example of my father uh, and his experiences of the Holocaust understood in his most broad terms uh, to, to talk about the impact of the Holocaust on him and then make some speculations about how his experiences uh, of persecution and flight uh, may have influenced his development of self-psychology. Um, and I think it's, as already been pointed out, I think it's, this is a great first panel in this, in this series uh, because in a way the whole series attempts to demonstrate the importance of history, uh, its influence on uh, people, on psychoanalysis, uh, and the way that psychoanalysts understand their patients themselves, and I think ultimately the world in which we live. So I'll start with the Holocaust in my family. This is the personal part. So the Holocaust in my family was basically never talked about. Uh, Roger Free has this makes this distinction between learned history and lived history. Um, you can probably figure out what he meant by those means by those terms. Uh, learned his, the Holocaust as learned history was talked about extensively, but the Holocaust as lived history by the members of my family was virtually never talked about. Um, my father never talked about uh, the Holocaust, and he never talked about his experiences of anti-Semitic per persecution in Vienna, either after the Anschluss with Austria in March of 1938 or before. And one of the things that I've come to appreciate in the last, I don't know, four or five years, actually since going to Vienna um, as a, the Freud scholar, or what, I guess it's whatever, the, the, at the museum, uh, what I've begun to appreciate with a new research project that I'm engaged with is just how virulent anti-Semitism was in Vienna already before 1938. Um, and I've only now begun to appreciate just what my relatives, uh, my Viennese Jewish relatives, probably experienced before the no arrival of the Nazis, let alone what they experienced after the Anschluss. <clears throat> but my father never talked about it his experiences of anti-Semitism before the Anschluss or afterwards. He never talked about the fact that he was expelled from the University of Vienna in April, 1938. Uh, he never, he was able to um, graduate with his, he got his medical degree because I think as a son of a Jewish, of a, of a war, World War I veteran, uh, he was given this brief window to take all his exams and, and get his degree. Uh, but he got his degree, but he was forbidden, and it states it in a little red stamp on his diploma, he was forbidden ever to practice medicine in the Reich. He never talked about his experiences of the fame, infamous pogrom Kristallnacht in November 1938. Uh, he never talked about how he managed to flee Austria in March of 1939, or how his mother, my grandmother, got out of Austria through Italy and came to the United States in 1940, quite late. 
Um, he never told me that his best friend, Sigmund Levery, whom I knew well growing up, that Sigmund Levery's name had originally been Sigmund Löwenherz, and that Sigmund Löwenherz was in fact the son of Josef Löwenherz, who was the head of the Jewish community in Vienna throughout the period of the Third Reich. He's a famous or in, for some people notorious figure because as the head of the Jewish community in Vienna, he was tasked with organizing the deportation of the Jews of, of, of the city and the Jews of Austria in general uh, to, to the East where they all, virtually all, were killed. Um, I, I think I'm actually studying Josef Löwenherz. I think he was a basically very decent guy doing the best he could. But he's a the, the fact that I never knew that Sigmund Levery's father was this extremely important historical figure is quite mm -hmm. ex extraordinary for me. With one exception, he never talked about his aunts, his uncles, his cousins who were killed in the Holocaust. Uh, I didn't know, hardly knew of their existence. I, I didn't know their names. I knew nothing about their personal stories. I've learned it since, but I didn't know it from him. And here's the cliched kind of almost, I don't know, it's, it's so common as to be maybe cliched. I never really knew as a child or growing up that I didn't know these things. Uh, I, I, I knew somewhere that I didn't know these things, I, I, but I didn't think it was all that odd that I didn't know these things. Although clearly my curiosity about these matters came through because I remember once I was having lunch with my father at the Art Institute in Chicago and he said, Tom, I, I know you want me to talk about my life in Vienna, but I can't. Uh, it makes me quote unquote, too sad. Well, I sensed the sadness for sure, but I think I also sent, sensed other things as well. I sensed fear on his part. Uh, I think the fear was largely for me. And I think somewhere in his mind, there was the notion that if I were kept innocent of all this information, I would be somehow protected. Um, I, I, said, I sensed guilt, which I now think probably was a form of survivor, survivor guilt. And I sensed humiliation and shame. Um, so I think it's safe to say, uh, it's an overused word, but I think it's safe to say that my father was traumatized by his experiences of anti-Semitic persecution and the Holocaust, uh, persecution and, and which damaged him psychologically, but which he did not want to or could not face up to and process. Now, I think as you all know, my father was not alone in this, uh, and he's not the only psychoanalyst who's been traumatized by his or her experience of the Holocaust. And he's not the only psychoanalyst uh, who was unable to speak openly um, about uh, or even acknowledge the psychic damage that the Holocaust had done to him. And even, I think more strikingly, not able to talk about the damage that the, psych that the Holocaust had done to others. Um, now this moves us away a bit from, uh, from Jews, but takes us to Germans actually. Uh, Germans in the Second World War extraordinary, uh, experienced an extraordinarily loss, suffering, um, and, and I think possibly also some buried guilt. And it's absolutely striking that not only was that suffering, that those losses, that guilt not talked about in public in, in, German, in West Germany in the first few decades after the war, it didn't come up in psychoanalyses, in psychotherapy either. And the reason I think is clear, uh, it didn't come up because it was too distressing for both the patients and for the therapists to talk about or to listen to. Uh, and if it's that kind of silence, this un, un inability to, to acknowledge and face up to the, the, the damage that was done in the war and by the Holocaust, also uh, characterized the response of psychoanalysts and psychiatrists to the victims of the camps, the, the concentration camps and the death camps, Jewish victims for the most part, but not only Jews. Um, so not only did were psychiatrists and psychoanalysts who were appointed by the West German government to look into compensation claims by inmates, not only did they deny uh, that the camp experiences um, actually caused deep psychological damage, uh, but Jewish psychoanalysts, not appointed by the German government, but in the United States and in, in England, probably, I'm not sure about that, but certainly in the United States, Jewish psychoanalysts also downplayed the devastating psychological experiences of camp survivors. 
their ongoing suffering, their ongoing serious symptoms uh, were generally attributed not to the camp experiences, but to their early life experiences in the family. Uh, I think here again, in part, uh, the camp experiences were simply too traumatic for survivors and for psychiatrists and psychotherapists to, to, to talk about and listen to. And I think obviously this is more an academic point, but I think this tendency to turn away from the psychologically traumatic impact of historical events like the Holocaust was only um, encouraged by psychoanalysis by, with its tendency to focus on unconscious wishes emanating from within the psyche, not from the environment, um, on drives and their defenses, and by its emphasis on the central psychological importance of early life experiences in the family. So I, am, I can't prove it, but I am virtually certain that the impact of anti-Semitic persecution and the Holocaust never came up in my father's training and analysis in Chicago in the late 1940s and early 1950s with Ruth Eisler, who was herself a Jewish refugee from Vienna. I'm, I'm virtually certain that didn't, they didn't come, th those issues didn't come up, those topics didn't come up because they were too traumatic for my father to talk about and for Ruth Eisler to hear. So, although I think my dad um, did not recognize or appreciate fully how much these historical events, these experiences that affected him and how much they had damaged him actually. I do think they contributed to his development of self-psychology. And I have three very brief speculations about that. So in the first place, <clears throat> my father's self-psychology focuses primarily or heavily on the role played by the environment in shaping the psyche. So in contrast to what was then during his life called classical psychoanalysis with its emphasis on intrapsychic drives, on innate libido and aggression and the defenses ranged within the psyche against them, uh, the self for my father was the product of the internalization and transmutation of the responses of the environment to, this, to the person. Um, and since, although this was not directly in my dad's work, I think it's implicit, since the environment that ultimately gives shape to the self includes the social and the cultural and the historical, not just the familial, I think that self-psychology uh, opens up a space at least for an appreciation of the powerful uh, impact that events like the Holocaust can have on human beings psychologically and indeed history in general. So that's the first speculation. The second speculation is that my father's emphasis on narcissism can be attributed in part to the humiliation, the degradation, the powerlessness he experienced in the face of anti-Semitic persecution or anti-Semitism. And I expect, uh, I think, I suspect, in fact, that victims of racial persecution um, are often narcissistically damaged by that persecution, by their helplessness in the face of it. And that tragically, as we know, racial, uh, racial prejudice can be internalized by people, by, by its victims. So I think then that my father's emphasis on narcissism can be connected with his experiences of anti-Semitism, of being told, in fact, that he wasn't uh, the cultured Viennese that he thought he was, uh, but he was actually ultimately not even fully human. Um, and third and last, I think that the centrality of empathy uh, to my father's vis vision of psychoanalysis as a field of inquiry and way of treating human beings uh, can be connected uh, to his effort to understand how people, actual people, could have done what they did to him, to his family, and millions of others. For one of the features of empathy, and Nancy mentioned my book, I make this point extensively, for one of the features of empathy is that it reduces Nazi persecutors to ordinary, if still appalling, human proportions. I doubt that my father ever connected his emphasis on the environment and shaping the self, on narcissistic needs and narcissistic injuries, on empathy, with his own historical experiences. Nonetheless, I think they played a role in the development of self-psychology somewhere, and that self-psychology can in fact be, in, be understood as a post-Holocaust psychoanalytic psychology. So just to conclude, psychoanalysts, this is my argument, psychoanalysts and the rest of us need to appreciate the powerful psychological impact 
that history, culture, society, politics have on human beings, of which the Holocaust is only a particularly vivid and powerful example. Uh, and I think an appreciation of the ubiquitous power of uh, psychological power of history will enhance the ability of psychotherapists to understand their patients, who, patients who have been affected by, by historical events, and an appreciation of, uh, of the influence of psychological factors in creating and in the experience and in, in the way people experience events like the Holocaust will enable psychoanalysts to have a positive cultural, social, and political impact. Because what I'm the case, I guess, I'm ultimately trying to make, and again, I may not need to make it to this audience, uh, is that psychoanalysis, psychoanalysts don't exist in isolation in their consulting rooms. Um, that the consulting room and the psych and psych consulting rooms and psychoanalysts are inherently part of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much for that vivid evocation that was both personal and uh, theoretical. Uh, and I'm hoping for the same from Dr. Kernberg, to whom I will turn the floor over now to talk about your own experience as a refugee and your own reflections on what the Holocaust and refugee experience uh, did to affect uh, psychoanalysis in terms of theory, treatment, training, or anything else you'd like to talk about. Well, um, first of all, I, I want to thank Dr. Kohl's very impressive uh, way of uh, relating his father's experience to his own way of uh, analyzing the whole situation. Um, I uh, also observed the striking phenomena that Dr. Koh described uh, the fact that the psychoanalysts who had escaped the Holocaust in Europe didn't talk about it, didn't mention it in themselves, nor in their patients in, in this country. It, there was a, 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 a denial which was remarkable and um, lack of uh, both talking about the personal experience and the traumatic implications and not even about the intellectual implications, the observation of this horrible uh, development, uh, the regression of uh, German culture into uh, savage primitivity. Um, so uh, in my case is very different. I was a child. I, I was nine years old when Hitler came into Vienna. I um, watched on the on the Maria Hilfer Straße as he was coming in, and I was yelling, Sie Kyle, with everybody else. I didn't have the slightest mm -hmm. idea. Uh, this came totally out of open sky. My parents never talked with me about anti-Semitism, and I had no experience of it really as a child until age nine. I lived in the in a kind of relatively neutral part of Vienna, not with a high Jewish concentration, the seventh district. That may have something to do with it. There were other areas in Vienna with much higher concentration of Jews. From one day to the next, the world fell in. Um, uh, Hundred thousands of people applauding Hitler uh, when he came in, when he gave his talk um, at the uh, at the balcony uh, of um, the the presidential palace, um, and um, then uh, I was exposed during that year in which I was in Vienna, from March uh, thirty. Eight to July 16, 39, when my parents uh, left with me, I was the only child. During that year, I was exposed to a sudden upsurge to uh, insults, attacks, depreciation on the street, 
open and consistent um, expression of hatred and um, depreciation of Jews. Um, on the banks, it was written not for Jews, not for dogs, nor Jews, or dogs and Jews forbidden the entrance in, in the Volksgarten, um, the, the, the park where my mother used to take me. Uh, and um, uh, I had a few personal experiences, um, once in which uh, a group of um, adolescents um, threatened uh, to attack me. I was with my father. My father tried to defend me. Uh, that created uh, um, an immediate larger group who were now going to attack my father. The policeman who was standing there, whom we knew personally, it took my father into custody, quote, uh, take, taking him away a few blocks to protect him and me. Uh, that was uh, kind of a part of daily life. And I had an experience in which I was with my mother, um, corner Neuburgasse Maria Hilferstraße, the, the very uh, densely populated uh, commercial corner. Uh, uh, one of the um, SA men, the, the lower level, uh, Hitler military, paramilitary organization detained my mother, forcing her to wash the pavement uh, at that point. And um, uh, so my mother started to wash the pavement. A multitude gathered around us, uh, not indignant uh, or shocked, no, enjoying it, making fun insulting my mother and me. So it was from one moment to the other, we were surrounded by an enemy crowd. Um, it, uh, my, I was kind of half, seemed of it seemed so strange that it didn't, I had a sense of derealization that uh, now retrospectively I can tell that I, I had a feeling as if I was not really there, this wasn't really happening. Anyhow, um, we were thrown out from school, from school, there were all kinds of expression. But what I want to stress is that mass phenomena, it seemed like absolutely every Viennese who was not a Jew hated the Jews. And um, uh, it created a sense of persecution and of inferiority. I must be defective, the Jews must be defective. Some, and of course, there were Hitler's speeches in which he would say outrageous things. In one speech, uh, uh, he said there was a shortage of butter, and he implied the Jews had been getting all the butter of the city. I mean, the, the kind of madness. Uh, that was uh, the mad slogans uh, on the day uh, was something that I only retrospectively could analyze. Um, uh, and uh, the, the fact that when the leader speaks outrageous lies, if they are sufficiently outrageous, um, the Jews want to poison Europe, uh, and uh, they are actively trying to poison Europe. Uh, you end up thinking something of it must be true. You can't say such enormous thing with some, some kind of truth. No? Um, Trump must have won the war, the, the war, the election. <laughs> um, my parents told me um, my parents told me the day what we left, we're leaving today for Italy. Uh, here's a uh, uh, suitcase, whatever toys you want to take with you, you can put in there. That's all we are taking. And don't say a word to anybody. That was said to me in the morning. In the afternoon, we went to the train to go to Italy. This was a preparation for immigration. And... Um, uh, of course, the memory of that trip, the anxiety of my parents before we got to the border, it was um, 
uh, July 16, the war was in the air. And of course, September 1st, the war broke out, border were closed, everybody was caught. And uh, at that point, uh, 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 out of the, the 120,000 Jews from Vienna, half of them could escape, 60,000 were caught, 10,000 went into hiding, 50,000 went into the death camps and were killed. Um, and um, all the rest of my family was killed, uncles, aunts, except one cousin who was vacationing in France. His father wrote to him, stay there. And uh, he escaped eventually with a group of children. They crossed the Pyrenean mountains into, escaped into Spain. So, uh, that was my personal experience. I had a wonderful time in Chile. It was a friendly country. Uh, it, it, to, to be on the street without being afraid of being attacked by anybody, people being friendly, to be in a normal circle, it was, uh, it was like intensive psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so the, 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 the radical, so it's, uh, I got, um, I learned the language, I learned Spanish pretty fast. I got adjusted, involved, in Chile, and uh, I only discovered in my own personal psychoanalysis in Chile how much that ongoing sense of persecution was still inside of me. Uh, it came out in a personal experience in which, um, God, I don't have time to tell you the whole thing, just in short, the acting chairman of the department of psychiatry in which I was now uh, assistant professor, um, uh, an acting chairman was uh, trying to take over courses that I had been invited to give with in other university schools. And um, I refused to do that as all other members of the department of whom he asked similar question did. I mean, the man was totally inappropriate, but I couldn't judge that. And his response to me was, if I were you, were one of your race, I would be more careful in the way I treated authority. Mm. So he, uh, he used the argument that I was a Jew <laughs> to, and that produced such an intense shock in me that that day I decided I had to leave. I went to the American embassy, find out about fellowships, scholarships, and this is how I got to the United States with the Rockefeller Foundation Fellowship to study psychiatry at Johns Hopkins. Had to go back a year later to Chile to teach what I had learned in the United States. And one of the first thing I did was to go to the office of that man, who in the meantime, the chairman of the department, a wonderful man, Ignacio Matevranco had come back. So he was no longer. And, and I told him uh, that he was a shithead and that I didn't beat him to the floor only because he was much older and it, uh, I felt sorry for him. And that he had to be very careful to be out of my way and do nothing that irritated me because I would, uh, hit the shit out of him wherever he did anything inappropriate. After telling him that in stronger words than what I'm using here now, I felt better. So going from the particular into the general, I didn't become a psychiatrist and a psychoanalyst because of the Holocaust, no. I became a psychoanalyst uh, psychiatrist because uh, I have an, I had an uncle, Manfred Sackel, who was an internationally famous psychiatrist. He discovered the treatment of the first treatment of schizophrenia with insulin coma treatment. Mm -hmm. um, he managed to emigrate from Vienna before the Nazi invasion and developed his institute in Boston. Uh, and he was a tremendous influence on my early educational experience in relation with my parents. 
Uh, then in my adolescence, I came under the influence of a uh, Jungian psychoanalyst who was a youth leader for Jewish German children in Valparaiso, Chile. And then when I got to medical school, I came under the influence of the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry, Ignacio Marte Blanco, one of the great Latin American psychiatrists who founded the Psychoanalytic Institute and Society in Chile. And I think it was the combination of this influence that made to me clear I wanted to become a psychiatrist and a psychoanalyst. And that's what I've been the rest of my life. So it's not, but the content of my interests as a psychiatrist and as a psychoanalyst have undoubtedly been profoundly influenced by that early experience in the direction of um, my uh, effort to study the importance of aggression in human behavior. Freud's theory seemed eminently reasonable from the start. To this day, uh, I, <laughs> important changes in the concept of drive. I won't go into, into the technical discussion of that, but I am convinced that basically the struggle between love and aggression is the basic motivational conflict of human beings. And that motivated me uh, to study and how come that individuals could so rapidly be transformed from ordinary human beings into beasts, ordinary human beings. And that led me gradually to the study of the structuralization of such transformation in personality disorders, the study of personality disorders, descriptively and psychoanalytically, and um, the influence of deep unresolved aggression, its origins in early childhood, its expression in, uh, in, 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 in uh, clinical syndrome. And that permitted me to developed um, my theories about personality organization, classification of personality, and the application of psychoanalytic treatment for the treatment of severe personality disorders, transference-focused psychotherapy, it all came in that direction. Um, at the same time, I became interested in uh, the social influence of the behavior of people when they are in group processes, the regression that occurs in groups. Freud's uh, book on mass psychology and analysis of, of, uh, of the ego um, has, a, has one statement, a little statement by Freud, which is fundamental that under conditions on the formation of a regression of, into a large group situation, the cognitive functions of the individual are reduced. Uh, one's personal intelligence is reduced, not only one's superego function. And uh, so I started group processes, uh, large groups, small groups, and, um, and the relationship between group regression and the malignant influence of certain personality structure in which aggression was organized in a way that prompted them toward leadership of large groups. Uh, and that got me to study the psychology of um, malignant narcissism. I was able to describe the syndrome of malignant narcissism um, and its treatment as part of the treatment of severe personality disorders. I'm involved at this point of studying the common feature of the influence of personalities such as Hitler, Stalin, Putin, Trump on their followers because the similarity of the personality structure of these four, not to mention 10 others, <laughs> is uh, very striking. So I'm interested in the social dimension of conscious and unconscious functioning, both in its malignant effects and in the question of how, what can we do preventively? Can we do anything preventively? Uh, I'm, these are the issues I'm involved with right now. Well, um, that has so that undoubtedly in this regard, the Holocaust has influenced me 
in in the attention to group regression aggression uh, politically uh, in um, powerful opposition to all political movements that tends to foster the development of regressive large groups, the isms, um, the utopian uh, movements uh, um, that go from the, um, the communist illusion uh, to the craziness uh, of, of Quanon, uh, nationalistic regression, as well as regression on the left, uh, because I think that uh, the human tendency to this to prevalence of aggression in the manifestations of large socially organized groups under conditions of severe splits of the society is a universal phenomena. And uh, we are slowly learning about it um, and um, hopefully we'll be able to um, uh, eventually do something in our educational efforts. I, I won't go into what kind of things should be done. Anyhow, uh, and in the international scene, it has made me, uh, of course, strongly identified with Israel as um, a country where Jews are no longer persecuted and tread upon, but exert their own power and authority. So I'm unashamedly pro-militarily powerful, strong Israel, and it's doing all it can to defend itself. So in this regard, um, I am uh, clearly also influenced by, by that experience. It should never, never happen again. Okay. Let me interrupt you there. Yeah. I guess you reached a kind of stopping point. I'd like to open it now to more of a conversation um, among the two of you and me. Um, and I, I think I'd like to start with the issue of silence that uh, Dr. Kohut raised. There are some exceptions to the silence. Dr. Kernberg has been one such extent, exception. Uh, Dory Laub has been another, Martin Bergman, Anna Ornstein, Robert Prince, Henry Crystal, Judith Kestenberg, and some other people, but mostly the silence has been deafening, as they say. Um, since the turn of the century, we seem to be uh, coming to a point where we're talking about this more. Uh, Jack Gresher has written about it, Sophia Richman wrote about her experience as a, a um, Hidden Child, Emily Kuriloff has interviewed both of you, I know. Bamak Vulcan has written about this, uh, and Jack Drescher has written about it, and some other people as well. So I, it seems like we are opening up now, but I kind of like to understand the silence, and also because my own interest is in individual differences, um, try to understand individual differences and who could talk about it and who couldn't talk about it. I've I've often been struck by individual differences in areas like this and how we have to apply the psychoanalytic idea of overdetermination and uh, uh, multiple function and uh, that anything that's uh, this much of, a, um, of, of an issue, the silence is multiply determined and differentially determined and I don't want to get reductionistic about it. But one idea that I ran into in um, Kirillov's recent or 2014 book was that those people who were able to talk um, were people who felt a very strong history of maternal love. So I'm curious if, if you would put yourself in that category, Otto. I think uh, Anna Ornstein said as much. Henri Parents has said that. Uh, Henry Crystal said something similar. There's something about a secure attachment that makes it more possible to talk about what to so many people is undiscussable. So 
So I'm basically asking if you think, Otto, that your mother's love for you allowed you to integrate what you went through to, to the extent that you could talk about it more than a lot of people, more than Tom's family, for example. I, um, somehow I, I wonder whether my father may have been more influential on me than my mother. Mm. Uh, she, my mother had a paranoid attitude. Uh, my father was a, he was a Austrian uh, patriot. He was a, a monarch. He was a, he was a monarchist, uh, mm. a Jewish monarchist, not, not infrequent at that generation in Vienna. He loved Vienna. Every weekend he would get me through the city to show me issues about Austria. I was deeply involved in the history of Austria, proud to be an Austrian. During the immigration, I formed part of free Austria movement in Chile and we would parade on the street of Valparaiso. So um, uh, that on the one hand, uh, and at the same time, my father was very interested. He had fought in the First World War, uh, was decor decorated, highly decorated in the First War, fell prisoner you know, on the Italian front a few months before the First World War ended, it was interested in military history, read about military books. So through him, I got a sense that uh, you get armed and stand up and fight. Uh -huh. uh, to my mother, just the suspiciousness and the fear, but uh -huh. but it was uh, more that identification with my mother. And my mother was right. In, in he didn't want to. He thought this phenomenon is going away. Let's just wait. Everything is. He he was not going. If it were for my father, I wouldn't be here. We would be dead. Mm -hmm. Thanks to my mother, we left. Uh, paranoid attitude. Thanks God. Yes, it was paranoia is quite helpful sometimes. Her fear, her fearfulness, suspiciousness, and uh, his affirmation of aggressive defense, somehow this came together. And um, uh, so I was free in developing my own aggressive response. And from early adolescence on, I became very aggressive with aggressive authorities was uh -huh. very, and stood up rebelliously uh, in school, in the university, and later on professionally, I was situation mm -hmm. in which I had to stand up to autocratic and corrupt leaders. So this is how I see the, the, the reason why I could affirm aggression and at the same time have the security really of uh, being together with those who were suffering the same experiences I did. Probably the, the fact that basically I had a good relation with both of my parents at this point uh, has something to do with the confidence that there was real love and mm -hmm. honest friendship that it that aggression could be confronted and resolved. Uh -huh. And um, uh, uh, oh, from that, there to that, ask you both that, about what so you that, think. So uh, that it's the combination of a good basis, I think, in a in a in a normal attachment situation, if you want to, yeah. or capacity for a normal dependence. And uh, the affirmation of the possibility of uh, uh, autonomy, self-affirmation, aggressive fights when necessary, without the fear that aggression would become so overwhelming that nothing good would remain in the world. And uh, I can be very direct with my patients, and my patients know that uh, I'm committed to them, interested to them, trying to help them, even if I confront them with things that are very painful for them to become aware of. 
Let me ask you both, uh, Tom Moore as a historian, but also as someone familiar with the psychoanalytic world and Otto as someone who is a major psychoanalyst, what do you think was the impact of the silence on psychoanalytic practice and training? For example, silence was a, a central part of the ego psychological um, approach to uh, doing psychotherapy. You may remain silent for a long time. Uh, I, I read a, an interview that Hedda Bolger did with Rudolf Lowenstein, and he said, well, he was silent because he didn't speak English. He learned English from his patients. So uh, silence figures into technique, actually. Um, but what about the dogmatism and the rigidity of mid-century psychoanalysis? What do you think the refugee experience um, had as an impact on that? Both of you. So uh, can I just, this sort of doesn't answer your question. It, it actually is more a response to what Otto said. Um, yeah. But but it does ultimately reflect this. I think it's to the silence as well. So the one just interesting aside is that uh, my father's mother, uh, like Otto's mother, was a, was a little paranoid or maybe more than a little paranoid. And I think it's very interesting that her side of the family all is, all left, all hmm. escaped. and the Kohuts, uh, my my grandfather had died before the Anschluss, but the whole Kohut family, all of them were, every one of them was killed. Um, so I think that the paranoia was in this case, as Otto suggested, kind of a, a, a good thing to be uh, because you appreciated the, the fear. And I think I wouldn't be surprised here again, the impact of history, that if you're the, the victim of anti-Semitic persecution, uh, that kind of fosters a kind of uh, paranoid worldview in part, because people in, in some ways really are out to get you. So that's the first thing. And now this is the other comment as a historian, and it relates to the silence question. So I think it's interesting, and Otto, what you described, I think it's relevant to what you know you, your own work, but certainly for my father, he had no difficulty um, writing about the Nazis. He wrote about Hitler and uh, other national socialists, but he didn't write about and he didn't talk about the experience of Jews. And in German history, which is just my field, uh, virtually all histories of the Holocaust until very, very recently focused exclusively on the perpetrators, exclusively on the Nazis. Mm -hmm. If you read books on the Holocaust, they're about the Nazis. They're not about the experience of Jews. And the signal uh, figure in bringing Jewish voices uh, into the history of the Holocaust was Saul Friedlander, whom many of you may have heard of. Um, also, Marion Kaplan wrote a really some wonderful work about the experience of Jews in Germany. But for the most part, people focus on the perpetrators, not on the victims. And I think part of the reason is that the perpetrator's behavior was a puzzle that made no sense. How could people do this? We need to understand so that it doesn't happen again. But I also think that part of it is, in my own work, I, I've, I've, written, I've written two books on non-Jewish Germans. I'm now trying finally to write about uh, Jew, my Jewish or J Jews in Vienna. Uh, and it's very difficult um, because it's not the, as bad as the perpetrators were, they had agency. And when you were trying to imagine your way or think your way or empathize with people who are the subject of persecution, you're dealing with feelings of helplessness and shame, powerlessness. They're, they're, they're unpleasant feelings. They're not... Mm -hmm. Um, they're not dramatic. They're not, um, again, there's no agency. And I think that part of the reason that people were silent about the Holocaust for so long, uh, and the reason that I, you know, my work in German history dealt with the perpetrators, not with the victims, not with my family, uh, is that it's too painful. Mm -hmm. It's very, very painful to think your way, to live in that world in your head. And and I think, um, you know, I'd again, Otto, you, in your comment about your mother having to wash the sidewalks and you're standing there, you know, I, I've, I didn't, my father never talked about this, but I had a student who brought his father who had survived Auschwitz to my class. And the father had never talked about his experiences in Auschwitz. 
and he began to weep in front of the class. And his overriding emotion was that he was afraid that his son would be ashamed of him. Mm -hmm. um, as he had been when he was a child in Auschwitz and his father was unable to protect him uh, from, from Auschwitz. So he felt that his father had failed him. And I think he, you know, in order to survive in Auschwitz, people had to do some pretty terrible things. Uh, and I think, so I think part of the reason for the silence is that it's very, very painful and shameful mm -hmm. and difficult to, to live in, in your, in your imagination. Um, and so it's easier to talk about the perpetrators. Let me ask Dr. Kernberg to comment on. Yeah, I, I very much agree with this. I think that uh, the silence reflects shame over having had to submit, having had to be, to accept, to tolerate, uh, to 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 ask, like to survive, mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, if. Uh, uh, if the hatred of the oppressor was strong enough so that the reaction was an enraged, angry opposition, uh, then one could deal with the aggression uh, and then one could talk about it. But the destiny, unfortunately, the, the Jews could not, they couldn't defend themselves. There wasn't a, sec a secret Jewish league throwing bombs to the buildings of the police. There was not a movement, nothing. The, the Jews sub submitted completely, uh, one might say, because they were so indoctrinated into the authoritarian uh, educational system of uh, of Germany and Austria that they couldn't even think about rebelling against authority. And well, uh, we also know the, realistically the, from, the, for example, the Warsaw the Ghetto that Jews who did rebel got decimated. So, and, and then the Nazis could have said, "See, we had to put down these uh, but, rebels." The, the rebellion of the ghetto of, of Warsaw is already a reaction of the Jews as a social group trying to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. It's the origin of, uh, of the pride of standing up against the oppressor. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, the German Jews uh, had nothing of that. And I think that in a deep shared unconscious shame then affected their behavior. And an unconscious identification with the enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, because those German psychoanalysts, when they started developing their psychoanalytic institutions in this country, became very authoritarian. There was yes, a, okay. a, that's where I wanted you to go. With psychoanalytic education, which persists to this day, and uh, and a reluctance to examine the authoritarianism in psychoanalytic education is a problem to this point. Uh, something which I'm very glad to have spoken up against uh, from the day as I, I became aware of it. Um, in Great Britain, um, the, like the British analysts who were not German refugees dealt very freely with aggression. The Kleinian movement dominant in Great Britain dealt with aggression freely. In the United States, uh, the German uh, psychoanalysts who were very influential New York, Boston, Washington, uh, uh, they were the silent ones. And um, uh, uh, silent and authoritarian hmm. ones. Hmm. Uh, but the culture also has certain influence. The, uh, the acceptance of deep aggression as part of human being 
comes natural in European culture. Uh, in American culture, there is a tendency to deny the centrality of aggression. There is something about American culture that fosters a uh, feeling that um, if you are not uh, if you are not uh, exposed to any excessive aggression, you will be perfectly all right. Everything will be fine. Uh, there, there is a certain denial of the human centrality of aggression in American culture, which may have contributed uh, to the attitude of the emigres who restarted psychoanalysis here. Well, I'm thinking of Hartman and the idea of um, uh, an average expectable environment, which he had not really experienced, or a conflict-free sphere. That sort of feeds into a kind of an American optimism. Would you agree? Uh, the the ego psychological orientation in some ways was a good fit with certain kinds of American tendencies. Yes, the ego psychological approach uh, harmonized with American culture. Uh -huh. uh, uh, it's interesting that uh, there has been a great difficulty in um, analyzing the aggression of patients, uh, both in this country and in Germany. Um, the non-Jewish German analysts have a tendency to, to, they are afraid of direct interpretation of aggression. There is a kind of a, there is a cultural uh, phobic attitude about aggression in German psychoanalysis because of that sense of uneasiness of the uh, savage nature of, na of national socialism. Um, uh, let me uh, <laughs> use your comments about aggression to bring up something I think that's relevant to our talking today. I suspect that one of the reasons that some of our extraordinary number of um, people uh, participating as our audience um, we're attracted by the juxtaposition of the names Kohut and Kernberg. <laughs> and uh, as I was preparing what I wanted to talk to you about, it occurred to me that when I was reading all about the kernberg Kohut debates of the 1980s, that um, it never occurred to me to think about them in light of the Holocaust and the refugee experience. But You've both talked about denial or dissociation from trauma. And your work, Otto, has emphasized human aggression and destructiveness and the, and the danger of regression toward a kind of male, mammalian destructiveness. Uh, that's one thing that can be denied. But the other thing that can be denied is vulnerability. And uh, I'm thinking about Heinz Kohut's emphasis on the, the dangers of fragmentation of the self and his sensitivity to issues of shame. So that one way of looking at some of the theoretical differences between the two of you may be that you're looking at one element of what was <clears throat> denied or dissociated, namely our our ten, our capacity for destructiveness. And Heinz Kohut was looking at our vulnerability to being destroyed, both of which can be denied, dissociated, and not integrated by people. And to some extent, we're not integrated by the ego psychologist. I, I'm curious about your reactions to this speculation on my own part. Uh, yes, I uh, uh, I agree. One can go one step further and raise the question: To what extent excessive vulnerability isn't a consequence of the projection of primitive aggression onto the other? 
so one feels attacked when one isn't attacked and and the other has to be very careful in in in, in treating one because one is hypersensitive to being rejected attacked mistreated thank you and tom what well, again, I, I have a reaction to what Otto said before you raised this extremely interesting point, um, sort of going back to the dogmatism of the 1950s and 60s, which I kind of like to talk about. But um, I'll just say this. I think um, I think what you said is really interesting, Nancy, and, and that I think, um, you know, when we're talking about, when we're looking at this from... Uh, the point of view of innate aggression and a kind of regression to a sort of very primitive aggressive state, we're talking probably there primarily about the perpetrators again. And uh, my father, I think, as I mentioned, he did write about the narcissistic vulnerabilities, I think, of Germans, why a figure like Hitler as this sort of idealized, grandiose uh, frankly, megalomaniacal figure could serve a certain idealizing function for Germans who felt defeated, uh, demoralized, depressed, helpless in the face of the loss of World War I, of the hyperinflation of 1923, which seemed life seemed completely out of human control, and then the depression. So I think he focused again uh, on that vulnerability in relationship again, to the perpetrators and to the, to the culture of the perpetrators in the way that what Otto has been talking about is also relating to that. But what I was trying to suggest maybe in my remarks is, although he didn't talk about it, that where the vulnerabilities come from is really in the case of those people who are the victims uh, of the aggression of the, uh -huh. of, the, of the large group, and that he didn't talk about. And I think if we go, if we look at the, the model of Jews in Europe, particularly during the 30s, there were really two models. There was the Zionist model, which was the more aggressive model, uh, which was let's go and found our own state in Israel, in Palestine, state of Israel and Palestine. And there was the assimilationist model, which is mm -hmm. you, you I, uh, lick ass, I think was the word you used, Otto, to describe <laughs> this. You, you try to fit in you try to, you convert to Protestantism or Catholicism. You try to become one of these, you are incredibly obedient and dutiful. And you are extremely uh, uh, anxious about Jews or others who, who kind of poison the well, who are aggressive or who say the wrong thing or who, who, aren't, uh, who aren't good Austrians or aren't good Germans. And my, this is wildly speculative, but I wonder whether the, propensity of psychoanalysts in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, which my father experienced painfully, and I experienced it painfully too, actually, uh, the, the tendency to want to write off certain groups of or certain psycholytic ways of thinking as not analysis. Yeah. It's a little bit of the, re the, 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 the uh, uh, an echo to me of as Jews who are assimilated, who are very frightened about their status, who feel very vulnerable, and who think that these others uh, who are behaving badly, who are one of our group, but they really are behaving badly, those aren't really psychoanalysts. That there's a kind of way, perhaps, that some of that dogmatism and the immediate uh, tendency to say, oh, what you're doing is fine, but that's not psychoanalysis. That there's something that might be connected with the experience of trying to assimilate into a fundamentally hostile culture. Um, so I think that I think that the challenge, or at least my challenge, and what I'm trying to do is, is to try to just not understand how people could have done this, but what it was like to having experienced what they've done. Mm -hmm. And it's not an edifying story it's a humiliating story. It's about shame. It's about pain. It's about powerlessness. Um, it's it's about ass looking and its failures. Uh, it's 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 not a pretty story, and that's what I'm going to hopefully work on and write about. But I don't know if I can. Well, we are at the one fifteen point, which gives us only fifteen more minutes, and uh, we had agreed ahead of time to open it up at this point and have uh, Dr. Tillman um, call whatever questions came through the Q&A. 
and uh, pose them to you. I'll say a lot of questions coming through the Q&A in the chat are of uh, great appreciation uh, to both of you for sharing your experience so personally and for the high level of the discussion going on. There are a number of questions that uh, are about linking more explicitly your personal uh, experience and the development of your uh, theories uh, within psychoanalysis and this uh, divergence of the understanding of aggression uh, Tom, between your father and Dr. Kernberg, um, and how that might relate to uh, early history. So those are big questions, uh, and I, I don't know what a good entry point would be, but uh, there's a wish to connect uh, the personal story to uh, the career and theory uh, that you developed. I know, Dr. Colbert, you're at a bit of a disadvantage because you don't want to be your father's spokesperson. But <laughs> one thing that occurs to me is that I, I think you've written before about how he identified with as a European more than as a Jew. Is, is that right? And, and he's sometimes been accused of having internalized anti-Semitism, but that's not your take on it. Am I right about that? Right. I, I mean, he certainly wasn't anti, he wasn't the least bit anti-Semitic. I mean, there was yeah. no question he was Jewish. I mean, he was perfectly aware he was Jewish. Um, I think, you know, it's a very, it's an extraordinarily complicated issue. And I we don't have time to talk about it, actually. But, um, okay. you know, I think he was on some basic level afraid all the time. And that if you're a Jew, bad things will happen to you. And yes. it was extremely important for him that I not think of myself as Jewish. Uh, because if you think of yourself as Jewish, people will come and try to kill you. I mean, I think on that, there was some really basic level of deep anxiety that he had his whole life long. That was probably, if we want to go back, it was connected with having had a mother who was more than a little paranoid. Uh, I think one of the tragedies of my father's life um, is that the happiest he ever was uh, was when the analysis of the self was published in 1971, I think. And at the moment that book came out, which was clearly on his part a, a work of self-analysis, I don't think there's any question mm -hmm. that he was working on himself there. And so I think when you talk about his views of narcissism and vulnerability and maybe not about so much innate aggression, I'm sure he got the innate aggression from his training analyses, as a training analysis, and maybe from Eichhorn before that in Vienna, uh, but I think the, the vulnerability was about he was trying to work on himself, and I think he actually had done a pretty good job of it. But just at that moment, he was diagnosed with cancer. Um, uh -huh. with coma. And for the from 1971 until his death, this was like the central issue in his life that he was dealing with that he, you know, I knew about it. We all knew about it. The family knew about it. My wife knew about it. And we all knew about it, but he didn't talk about it. So it was a secret. And, uh, you know, in a way, there's suddenly the external world had been hostile, and now the internal world is hostile as well. Uh, something yeah. within him was growing. So anyway, I don't want to get into all of that, but I do think that my father, if you want the where the personal comes in, uh, I think my father's work on narcissism is in some measure, is probably true for most psychoanalytic contributions, was in some measure an attempt to understand himself. Thank you, Otto, did you want uh, to follow that up? Yeah, uh, uh, my father acted as a European, yes, uh, very much so, but he also was very conservatively Jewish. And huh. for him, Judaism was an uh, old culture that had its heroes and moments in history of uh, courage and, um, and assertion. So... Huh. Uh, so he was both assertive and adjusted to the environment. Uh, so you uh, don't identify as to, much with the we fear. We have to separate a creative integration with the environment, trying to find a synthesis from a submission to the enemy uh, that mm -hmm. is shameful. Uh, the attitude of the German Jews was shamefully submissive after having a history, a glorious history of a proud integration while self-affirming -affirm themselves. The 
the the the German the Jewish Renaissance, German Jewish Renaissance in the 18th and 19th century brought about a very proud integration of Jewishness and, and Germanness uh, mm -hmm. that was destroyed um, uh, by the Nazis. It is true that there was a strong anti-Semitism in German culture, but there was also a strong assimilation that was affirming the combination of both values. The, the, that's an important differentiation what has to make. The psychoanalysts who are uh, intolerant of those who are not doing psychoanalysis, uh, I mean, the, the ultra rigid uh, psychoanalysts, uh, that's uh, clearly a, a defensive function of people who for whatever reason, I'm not getting to it, are allergic to research in scientific progress. And um, uh, going once again to my personal life, um, I'm a proud Jew and I'm married to a Catholic woman who is a proud Catholic and I find that we make a wonderful combination. <laughs> so that's, uh, uh, there's an alternative uh, to submissive assimilation. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jane, what else do you have for us? Uh, Daniela, I don't know if any uh, questions are coming from your side, but I can certainly go through and there are so many questions uh, coming in. Um, That's the I, I think there are questions about, uh, related to the silence uh, that we've spoken about. And uh, do either of you have thoughts of, about the intergenerational transmission of trauma and the stories that are, are being lost, Dr. Kernberg, you're one of the few people who can uh, give a, an eyewitness or a lived experience account of having been in Vienna. Um, and how are these stories to be carried forward uh, to other generations? Uh, and when the stories have been silent, uh, Tom, as in your case, in your family, uh, how do they show up in subsequent generations? Well, it's, it's like, let me respond to that. This panel is the perfect example. I mean, and and this whole series is the perfect example. I, I think that for the most part, you know, there are the few exceptions that you that that Nancy you talked about, but but Otto is being a, an exceptional exception, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. But the older generation of people who actually experienced uh, the Holocaust, most of them didn't talk about it. Um, and uh, my generation didn't talk about it either, but I think in the last 20 years, 15 to 20 years, this subject is finally opening up and people are able finally to talk about the silence. The silence is being broken. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there are all sorts of books now being written in by people of my generation about um, who are children of not national socialists, German national socialists, children of Jews, um, and that I think part of the reason that this discussion can occur is because a different generation is at a different point in its life and that is now able and, and needs to talk about these matters, whereas 20 years ago, people weren't able to do it. Um, so, so I think that there's something about, it's something, it is a generational task, perhaps, for, for my generation, um, and it's... Um, and it's also where we are in our lives, I think. You know, I just, I have fantasies all the time. I wish I could talk to my dad about all this. But, you know, I can't. And uh, and it's. I think it's going to be very interesting. You know, I'm, one of the things when we put this panel together, I'm really glad we have the last, the last, or the series together. The last se panel is not about the Holocaust. It's about people who have come to the United States who are immigrants, who are analysts or psychotherapists and what their immigrant experience is like. Yes. And that's something we didn't really talk about, but you know, what it's like, you know, you know, my father could barely speak English when he came to the United States, you know, what it's like to speak with an accent um, and so on. Anyway, so I'm glad we're talking about that, but, but I think it's just, it's no accident that we're doing this now. And I love the idea that, that this, that Alison Lotto had the brilliant idea to have us, give space for people to share their stories um 
on this program. And so I hope people will do that to talk about what their parents experience. Cause you know, I'm not, I'm not sure if my children are, is that, are that interested in this stuff? <laughs> uh, um, uh, but I feel, you know, like a passionate need for us to 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 engage with it. We have time for uh, one more series of questions. Uh, this is a question uh, both Dr. Kernberg and Dr. Kohut have written about empathy. Why do we lack so much empathy in U.S. culture? We're more a shaming and canceling culture. We're so po polarized. Uh, can empathy be cultivated? If so, how? Uh, would you both speak to how we extend empathy to both sides, to Nazis and Jews, to white extremi uh, supremacists in this uh, country and to those of color? Can this help us mend our splits? What's the role of empathy and the profound uh, cultural splitting that we see? Well, there's an easy one. <laughs> to end up on, yes. Who wants to grab it? Well, um, empathy is actually a complex uh, concept uh, because uh, it refers to the capacity of um, feeling uh, with what the other is feeling, uh, a concordance with the central subjective experience of the other person while having a clear sense of uh, our being different persons. So empathy in contrast to fusion uh, or symbiosis means feeling with another person who at the same time is respected, considered and accepted as another person. But that is only one aspect of empathy. Sometimes empathy means to be empathic with the feeling of those who the other person can't stand. <laughs> and uh, uh, so that one is empathic with the hatred that the other person has to a third one. And one can see the perspective of the third one. And sometimes as a therapist, you have to be empathic with the patient and sometimes with the patient's objects. These are the, tech, in technical language, the concordant and complementary aspects of countertransference. The broader... but, uh, I think the question was to apply it to the contemporary political scenes. So let me give um, Dr. Kohut the last word here oh, and great. see if you have uh, some thoughts about that as a well, historian. So, and I've, you know, I've, obviously I've spent years working on empathy and reading about empathy. And empathy is not just simply a force for good and understanding and compassion. It's also can be used to destroy people. It's it's uh, you think your way inside the experience of another person in order to find their weak link and they already know how to manipulate it and so on. So it's mm -hmm. but but I think what's you know what's difficult in the United States right now is is uh, you know I think there is an anxiety about I think I don't want to use the word aggression, but it, that there's a kind of people are very are uncomfortable with a whole postmodern um kind of everything is a bit up for grabs and they want to have very clear boundaries and clear identities and uh, essentialize things. And mm -hmm. I think that part of the self-righteousness is about anxiety. Again, this is my dad, but it's me, that there's a kind of vulnerability and fragility behind that, 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 that it feels, that feels very much at risk. So I think, you know, it's very, very difficult to, you know, but I think essential that we try to understand Trump supporters and that uh, mm -hmm. Trump supporters try to understand us. But to get back to what Otto said uh, early on in this, there's a time when you empathy has to stop and you need to fight. You know, there's some times when you have to stand up and you need to fight. And, um, and I think, you know, that's, that's the challenge that I feel is that, you know, it's, I, I do my best to be empathic with people with whom I disagree profoundly and with whom I generally have almost no contact because we all live in our own bubbles. Um, but at some point, you know, we still, 
need to stand up for who we are and what we believe. So I think it's just finding the balance between empathy and then uh, assertiveness for one's own values and beliefs is, uh, is a really tricky thing. Well, thank you both. <laughs> yes, I want to thank uh, Dr. Kernberg, Dr. Kohut, Dr. McWilliams, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Finzi at the uh, Freud Museum. And uh, we've had a really wonderful uh, first round table and I encourage all our participants to attend our second round table, which will be on Saturday, February 11th. That will uh, address refugee psychoanalysts 1920 to 1955, enriching psychoanalysis in the Americas. So I invite you all to return for uh, the next uh, in the series of round tables on February 11th. So thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Sure.